wrap up this series today that we started on Easter titled, It Is Finished, talking about the finished work of Jesus Christ. And along with our Wednesday service uh, going through the book of Romans, we've really been realizing that grace is not just the power to save us, but Grace is the power that empowers us to live the Christian life. Not only do we accept Christ as our Savior, but we continue to walk in the same faith, the same grace that we received that God has saved to begin with. Uh, your sins aren't a problem. It's a finished work. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so it's this grace transfer that has taken place. God has made us as righteous as himself. And to a religious person, we'd be like, oh my goodness, how can you say that? That is exactly what the Bible is saying. We don't get what we deserve. We get what Jesus deserves. Now, you've got to let that sink in. I'm not saying that we're God. I'm not saying that we're Jesus. But what he's saying is he takes our sin, but then gives us his righteousness. And so you get the very best that God has for you. Uh, we need to approach God with confidence, come before the throne with, with boldness and receiving grace and mercy in the time that we need it. Last week, we talked about God's true nature, and we found out that the law was given as a tutor to bring us to Christ. In fact, the Bible is very clear that grace has always been the nature of God, and that's what we discussed last week. If you look at uh, the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, throughout 6,000 years of man's existence, roughly, 4,500 of those years have really been under grace, all right? under grace, and the law came just to bring us to Christ. So the law had a purpose, but the law doesn't make us right with God. In fact, let's read this, Galatians 3.23. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. You see that, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under the tutor for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And so we're no longer under that tutor. So the law is good. It's perfect. Ten commandments are good. And it really would do us well to not murder, to not commit adultery. But understand the law doesn't have a purpose once it brings us to Christ. It only came for that reason, to show us that we need a Savior and then to show us that that Savior was Jesus Christ. And so the, body, the Bible's very clear. Once you're a Christian, the law really is not anything that you need to have to do with. You don't have to keep it. The law doesn't make you righteous. God is not judging you according to that. He has given you grace. Somebody say grace. grace. And understanding that it's a finished work, and it's so liberating because so many Christians, we start every time we pray, we go back to square one, if you will, and, oh, God, forgive me of my sins, and, and everything we messed up, we try to list them all. Listen, give yourself a break. You can't remember all the sins you've committed. It's impossible. Now, confession of sins has a, a place, and we've talked about that. I'm not going to get into that this morning. But really, it, it gets the devil off our back when we confess our sins, and it also helps us to confess to someone else, get it out in the light, and then we can just start to walk in more and more freedom. But understand, if you receive Christ as your Savior, you don't ever have to ask for forgiveness once again. It's taken care of. Again, a religious mind would say, well, well, what do you mean? Well, you're not saved by your works. You didn't get saved by works, and you can't keep it by confessing every single sin. Again, it has a purpose to confess sin, but listen, sometimes you're going to miss it. I remember when I was a young Christian, just a few months in the faith, and we were sitting under some really good teaching, so I started to really learn the truth, but I remember there's some things I was just kind of ignorant of, and I remember thinking, boy, the rapture is going to happen. I had never heard about the rapture, and I'm not going to teach on that this morning. The Bible says that uh, Christians will be taken out when Jesus comes back, and we'll meet with Jesus in the air. The dead in, in Christ will rise first, and then we'll be together with the Lord. And so I knew about that teaching, but I remember thinking, boy, if I get up in the middle of the night and I stub my toe on the, on, the, on the coffee table and I just go, oh my, and I say whatever you would say. You can put a word in there, but, but you say something and I would think, boy, if, if, the, if the rapture happened right then in an instant, because that's what the Bible says, in the twinkling of an eye, I thought I wouldn't make the rapture. And I literally was afraid, but listen, you don't have to live that way. In fact, that's impossible. If you had to live that way, then the law would have to be something that wouldn't have come to an end for the Christian. And we just read clearly, and we've looked at other scriptures. Again, it's not that the law is, is not good. The law is good, and it's God's law, and it's perfect, and it's just. But it wasn't given to make us right with God. And you don't, you know, you're going to miss some sins along the way. You need to lighten up. 
Forgive yourself. Walk in the grace that God has given you. And I believe with all my heart that when we have a revelation of grace and the love of God, which we're going to talk about uh, more this morning, I, I believe that we will live a holy life more by accident than we ever would on purpose because God starts to really work through you. And it's such an incredible, liberating truth, all right? Uh, God had to create the law to teach us right from wrong until we could be born again. And I want to just say this. you got to remember that no one is sent to hell, if you will, for individual sins. And I also want to say this. I believe God's grace and mercy are so powerful. In fact, last week, again, when we looked at how grace was so powerful, even through the Old Testament, it was powerful, that God's nature has always been grace. It's always been mercy. Uh, God even took care of those who were under the different dispensations. And the Bible says that somehow Jesus went and preached to those who were in Sheol. He preached to them. And he said, the Bible says in, in Ephesians chapter for that he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Well, who did he lead captive? Those who were held that didn't get to hear the message of grace. You say, well, how did he do that? I don't know, but the Bible says he did it. So I think you have to work hard at not making heaven. I believe that with all my heart. The Bible says in Romans chapter one and other places that God makes himself known to every person. And I know some people will say, well, God's never made himself known to me. Well, he has, all right? The Bible is true. Let God be true. And every man, what? A liar. Because God tells the truth. And every person God reveals himself to. I think that every world religion is trying to seek God. They're just doing it in the wrong way. Men are responding to God by their works. And Christianity could be no different. So many people respond to God by their works. So we say, okay, I'm saved through Jesus, but then we live our lives, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, all these things. And really, we become judgmental. We become religious. And really, the love of God can't flow through us that way. We need to have a revelation of the grace of God, the love of God. And when we realize that God paid for our sins and that he isn't mad, it enables you to enjoy God's love in a much deeper way. In fact, the Bible says that we walk by faith and not by sight. You can't even live by faith unless you understand and have a revelation of God's love because faith works through love. And so that's how we live. So I want to talk the next few moments about our relationship with God. Relationship with God. 1 John 1, verse 1. 1 John 1, uh, uh, 1 John 1, 1, yes. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, and these things we write to you that your joy may be full. And so what John is saying, we just read it, is through a revelation of God's love, a revelation of Jesus Christ, what, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Through that revelation, we have fellowship with one another, first of all, but we also have fellowship with God the Father and God the Son. We saw uh, last week that the Bible says, walk ye in the light as he is in the light. You'll have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus will cleanse you from sins. And so it's a revelation of God's love sets us free and allows us to have a relationship with God the Father and God the Son. God's not interested in a bunch of works, not a bunch of, of rules and a bunch of regulations. Uh, I don't know if my wife Trish is in this service. She sat through uh, first service. She was up here helping lead worship in the middle. And, and we've been married for 30 years tomorrow. 30 years. It's amazing. Those of you that, that, that were kind of delayed in your reaction, you haven't been around me much, so you don't realize how amazing that that is. Uh, but but it's, it is, it's simply amazing. And just in a, a, a relationship, the Bible really compares marriage to our relationship with Christ. It calls the church the bride of Christ. And her and I wouldn't have a 30-year relationship. And, of course, Janet and David, 44, I think she said they've been married. You wouldn't have a good, healthy marriage relationship if I was saying, okay, Trish, do this. Make sure dinner's at this time. Make sure you do this. Make sure that, that the, 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 the table's set and everything is clean. And get in the kitchen and make me a sandwich. If, if I lived that way, our relationship would not be good. She would have booted me, slapped my face, and, you know, I would have got some correction. But, but listen, God is the same way with us. He wants a relationship. You can't come with rules and regulations. What's happened is her and I, through our relationship, 
Now, I've got a lot more rough edges than her, but she had a few things that God gleaned from me and helped her with. And in a marriage relationship, the Bible says iron sharpens iron, and even so much more in a marriage, what ends up happening is you kind of just smooth off, off the rough edges in one another, and then you kind of pull and glean the good out of one another, and you, and you kind of start to think and act like each other in the good ways. Hopefully it's not the bad ways, but this is how a marriage should work in Christ. So can you imagine how much more in our relationship with God? He doesn't want a bunch of rules and regulations that are laid down. He wants us to seek him. We should have this attitude that we can't wait to get up tomorrow morning just to sit down with a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or a glass of water or nothing, or whatever, however your prayer starts. And just I just can't wait to sit down and I got a cup of coffee and, oh, I get to spend time with my father every day, every day. You say, well, you're a preacher. No, I prepare messages separately. I can't wait to spend time with him just so I can find what he wants to do that day in my life. And this is really what each and every one of us should be doing, really enjoying our, our relationship with God. It's not a bunch of do this, don't do that, and we give him our laundry list, and we give him all of our needs. Listen, God wants to know what your needs are, but listen, even before you ask, he already knows what you need. It's okay to ask, and we should, and, and prayer is extremely important, but understand something. He just wants a conversation with you. And so I believe as Christians, we should be spending time with our Heavenly Father in His Word, staying in His presence, yearning after Him, longing after Him. Again, I go back to husbands and wives, and you'll keep that flame burning if you continue to chase after one another. I mean, no, you know, in the beginning of a relationship, all you want to do is spend time with that person. I remember when I first met Trish, man, that's all I could think about. Spending time with her when I wasn't with her, how do I get to spend more time with her? I may know what I'm talking about. And none of you do. Okay, a couple of you do. Some of you are married and sitting next to your spouse. You better raise your hand. You're in trouble. You know. Say, so how do you stay married for 30 years? I still chase her around the house. That's how. But anyway, so you just, <laughs> I chase her around the house, tell her to make me a sandwich. You know, I already said that. But... <laughs> But you remember, you couldn't wait to spend time with them. And we'd hang out together, and then you'd get home. So you remember, this is way before cell phones. How did we ever live without cell phones? I have no idea. <laughs> it's amazing to me. But So we, before cell phones, and we'd spend time, and we'd be up late. I'd get home. It could be 2 in the morning. It didn't matter. And I'd get home, and she'd call me, and we'd talk on the phone until I fell asleep. And then I'd be woken up by, how many remember this noise? Can, 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 can. Anybody remember that noise? Okay. Maybe phones still do that. I don't know. I've just got a cell phone now. But you just couldn't wait to spend time with them. Where is your relationship with Christ and with Father God? Is it like that? And so many times we can start out that way, but then we kind of we just let it fade. And listen, if, if, if your relationship with God has faded, it's not God's fault. It's your fault. But here's the good news. You can get right back on track because he forgives like no other. I mean, he just forgives. But it's kind of like in Christ, understand, you are forgiven of all your sins even if you don't confess them. He has already taken care of it because you're imperfect and he knows it, but he's so wild about you, he took care of it. And so you just got to get back in shape and pursue him. Listen, the most important thing that you and I can do as human beings, as Christians, is to seek after God the Father's heart and to know him. That's what Christianity is. It's a relationship. It's not rules. It's not regulations. 1 John 2, 3, it says, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So many times people will read that scripture and they'll say, Okay, well, do this, don't do that. I'm going to keep the Ten Commandments and then I'll know God. No, it's just the opposite. When you have a revelation with God, I said first service and I'll say again, my relationship with Trish, 30 years tomorrow. I don't not commit adultery just because the Bible says don't commit adultery. I mean, no, it's good to not commit adultery. I don't commit adultery because I don't want to mess up what we have. Is anybody with me? And that's the way it is with God. Why would you want to allow sin to just drag you away from God the Father? And you don't have to feel bad about it because he cleanses you and is continually working in you. But listen, it's through a relationship. When you have a relationship with God, you want to please him. You want to keep his commandments because you realize how crazy and how madly in love he is with you. And that's really what Christianity is, is a relationship. Jesus, in fact, he said that this is eternal life, that you would know the Father and that you would know the Son. Eternal life is about relationship. God is in the relationship business, not the works business. And through loving God, his love will flow through us to other people, and that's God's design. And you can't give away what you don't have. So you need to experience God's love. So many times we just say, well, God, I'm trying to love this person, and I'm trying to do this, and I need to do that. Listen, if you're trying to love a person in the natural, it won't work. 
It's impossible. Can we just be honest? Have you ever had someone in your life that they're impossible to love? Can, anybody? All right. All right. Oh, boy, you ain't going to raise your hands for nothing this morning. A bunch of saints in here or something. Let's try that. How many have had a person that's very hard to love them? It's just like, oh, my gosh, that person. All right, you know what I'm talking about. Now, let me just say this. That person that's so hard to love needs love the most. And they're trapped probably in a cycle like I'm talking about, trying to do this, trying to do that, trying to do good works, and then judging everybody else for not meeting their needs. But God wants you to love them through him, or he wants to love them through you. Let me say it that way. That's a better way. Because he's working in you to will and do his good pleasure, giving you the desire and the power to please him. So you say, God, I can't love this person. Right now, this person, I can't love them, but I know that you can. And then ask him to show you how much he loves them. Start to reveal his heart for them. Listen, I've done this before, and I know many of you probably have. But when you start to ask God to show you the way he sees people, in fact, you should ask him to show you the way he sees you. Hmm. And you know, the sad truth is so many people think that God sees them as a mess up, as second best, as no good. But you know, that just isn't true. There's no person that ever thought that about their own child. You think about a newborn baby, you're so excited, you can't wait. He's like, man, I mean, and then there's grandparents. How many know, I, I don't think I'm going to get this bumper sticker or, or, or these license plate, but it says, let me tell you about my grandkids. Anybody ever seen that? Let me tell you about my son who's on the honor roll or my daughter who plays this sport. We're so proud of them. We want the best. N nobody in a, with a healthy mind wants bad and terrible things for their kids. Can, can, can you lift your hand for that at least? Okay. And so God, God has nothing but your best in mind. God wants you to have the most successful life you possibly could, and he knows the only way that you can achieve that successful life is a relationship with him. And that, why Je that is why Jesus said, it is finished. It's a finished work. You believe in Jesus, and now you don't have to prove anything. The law brings us into a relationship with God. Look at this. Do you really love God and truly have his love in you? Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there's no law. And I know that probably every one of us here have read that and say, okay, I'm going to live in love. I'm going to walk in joy. I'm going to have peace today. And I believe we should confess things over ourselves. But understand, we're not making a choice. It's something he does in us, like I just explained. I can't love this person. Today, Father, I do not have joy. This situation is beyond me, but I know you love me so much that you're working this thing out for my good. And so you know that he has nothing but your, your good in mind. And, and the truth is, I think so many times when we put ourselves under works, and I've seen so many Christians that fall into this category, sorry to say, is we put ourselves under this, do this, don't do that. And what we see is we expect people then to meet our need when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit. We expect people to love us. We expect people to be our joy. We expect people to be long-suffering and kind and good to us. And it's okay to want those things, but we expect that to be our source. And then when people don't respond that way, we get angry and say, oh, they're not a very good Christian. They didn't love me. They weren't gentle with me. Can you believe they did this or they did that? The problem is you're not asking God to love them through you. You're expecting them to love you to meet your need. And the fruits of the Spirit we just read about, listen, those are fruit. And I think many people, most people, in fact, want to eat the fruit, not be the fruit. I'll say it again because it was good. I'll say it over here. Most people want to eat the fruit, not be the fruit. Now, there's nothing wrong with eating good fruit, but the Bible says we'll bear fruit. We're supposed to bear fruit in other people's lives, and that should be what we're doing is saying, God, I know that you're so good. You've expressed your love to me, your gentleness. In fact, David said this, you're what? Your gentleness has made me great. The gentleness of the Lord working in you will make you great. And so we say, God, I thank you that you showed me kindness and gentleness. You forgive me when I'm a knucklehead, which is most of the time. <laughs> Can we just be honest? So, Lord, I know that this person is starving for love, and so I know that I have to respond through you because I can't do this. And, and they expect me to meet a need, but I can't meet their need, but you can. And then what happens is the fruits of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit start to flow through you because you're knowing that God is going to work through you way beyond what you could possibly do. It says in Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory. In the church. So God's working in us way beyond what we could possibly, possibly imagine. First John 2 4, it says, He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 
And most people would read that and say, okay, I don't want to be a liar. I want to be a good person. So I'm going to be a person that keeps the truth, and I have to keep the commandments. No, we've got it backwards. John isn't saying that if you keep the commandments, you'll know him. He's saying that if you know him, you'll keep the commandments. This is what he says over and over and over again in this book. Having an intimate relationship with God will cause you to love other people because he'll love them through you. Verse 5, it says, But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Why? If the love of God is perfected in us. He's perfecting in us what he wants to do. Living holy is a fruit. It's not the root. So many times we just, oh, I'm going to be a person who lives holy. You can't make that choice. You can't do it. It's impossible. But you can say, Lord, I know that you've made me holy, and because you've made me holy, the fruits of your spirit are flowing through my life. It's just a whole mindset. We have to look at it differently. It's not something that you're earning. It's not something that you're trying to keep. It's something that he's placed on the inside of you, and now it's coming out. You need to draw it out. The kingdom of heaven is not something that you say, hey, look, it's over here. Hey, look, it's over there. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is what? Inside you. And that's really what Christianity is. And the love of God will motivate you differently to live your life differently. Matthew 5, 39, but I tell you, Jesus is speaking, I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, anybody here wearing a tunic today? I'm just curious. Anybody you got your tunic? Everybody have their tunics on? Okay. I think they wear tunics over at Walmart. I remember I wore a tunic when I was in retail years ago. All right, let's get back to the word. I just, sometimes these things pop in my head. If I don't get it out, that's all I'll think about. And so I'd rather just get it out. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him for two. So if he takes your, your jacket, give him your coat also, is what Jesus is saying there. And if you read this, you take a look at it and say, well, that's hard to do. How many would say that's hard to do that sometimes? Okay, let me just amp it up. It's impossible. You can't live like this. You can't do it. So free yourself. I mean, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't expect this, but it's God working in us to will and do his good pleasure. We just have to accept, I can't do it. And this will just rock some people's worlds because they think, oh, no, I'm a good person. No. What you're doing is you've made some good choices, and you're better than the person you're comparing yourself to, and you're judgmental, and you're mean, (laughs) And you look at people and expect them to be good at the things that you've acquired some goodness at. And so you puff yourself up and think you're better than they are. And that's just the truth. Can we be honest? You can't do this. It's impossible. We all need to say, you know what? None of us can do this. But God can do it through me. Say through me. And that's why we need a revelation of God's love. Because I guarantee you, the rest of your life, you are going to be faced with situations that are impossible to face, impossible situations to love, impossible situations to overcome. And so we need to learn how to draw strength from him. It's no longer us living, but him living through us. Look at verse 20, Galatians chapter 2. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Get a hold of that this morning. But Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith. Somebody say faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So my faith is in the Son of God. What, that he's done all this, that he has a complete work, that is something that's finished. I'm believing that he's already made me as righteous as himself on the inside, even though my flesh doesn't seem to be because it's not. But God has already finished the work. Colossians 3, 3, for you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. This is a foundational scripture for this church. Real people live in real life with a real God. Your life is hidden in Christ, in God. How many know that's a good thing? We're real people. We mess up sometimes, all right? We're living real life, and real life brings opportunities. Has anyone found that out? But we have a real God who's already finished the work and is living and breathing and moving on the inside of those who believe in him. Do you believe in him this morning? And that's how God expects us to live. You can't do it in your own strength. It's totally impossible. In fact, the, the, the love of God will motivate us in a whole different way. 2 Corinthians 5.14 He says, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. What what is he saying? The love of Christ compels or motivates us. God's love will motivate you to live in a whole different way. And it sure beats do this, don't do that, being judgmental. I remember this is uh, probably 16 years ago. 
It was the second church that Trish and I helped at as associate pastors. So 16 years ago, so Tony, um, oh, I saw you walking, I thought you were up here. So you're 29, so this is, you were 13 at the time, probably up there, 12, 13. And I remember we moved to help a little church over in Ionia, Michigan. Maybe some of you know where that is. They got more prisons there than anything else. There's more inmates than there are people that live in Ionia. If you, they got six prisons over there. It's just east of Grand Rapids a little bit. And we went there to help with a, a small church, a thriving church. Now, as a matter of fact, John Prominsky, the lead pastor, uh, they built a sanctuary downtown, and, and there are about 400, 500 people meeting right downtown, and it's just it's awesome what God's done. He's going to be here uh, in the fall sometime, so you'll get to meet him. But we went there, and I was this worship leader and, and executive pastor. And I remember the day that we moved, and maybe you remember, I don't see him so much anymore. Once in a while you do, but they were pretty popular 10, 15, 20 years ago, and they're just like these little white metal signs, and some people put a scripture on there. One of the most common scriptures was Romans 6, 23, uh, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life or eternal life through Christ Jesus. Maybe you've seen that. Well, they had one of these, these little white signs. I remember we moved in, and you would, they had it setting uh, perpendicular to their house, so when you drove down the road, you could see it. Well, we're unloading our truck, and I noticed that they moved it so we could see it. And it said, the wages of sin is death. They left the last part off. <laughs> I mean, I looked at that and I thought, oh my goodness. But see, that's what religion will do. Understand something. That's what religion will do is it causes us to judge people. And so many times we'll say, oh, you know, those wicked people over there and this person and that person who believes different than you. Oh, I can't wait till God comes back when God comes and takes all the Christians out and then they're going to get it. Well, that is not God's heart. Are you crazy? The Bible says that God is willing that none would perish, but all would come to repentance. You need to get a heart check. You're living in the natural, hating people that are different than you. Hey, I understand, like I've already said this morning, some people are hard to love, but they're the ones that need to be loved the most. And God wants to love them through you. So you can't have this attitude, go get them, God. Go get them. They messed up. Well, yeah, they messed up, but so did you. Does this make sense to you? I mean, it, it doesn't work living like that. God wants to live through us. God's not holding our sins against us. That is the good news of the gospel, and people need to hear it. People don't need you judging them. My goodness, there's people judging people all over the place, Christians, non-Christians alike. Just get on Facebook. You'll see it. Oh, my goodness, some of the comments on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. I just don't spend a whole lot of time on it because it's like, I don't know. It's just not good for you. Let me just say that. There's some negative stuff on there. We can be positive. We can let our light shine on there, but there's some stuff. Boy, if you spend, if you spend more time searching Facebook and your Instagram account and what else you got out there, there's all kinds of things. It don't matter. Whatever you got. If you spend more time tweeting than you are reading the Word of God and seeking God, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. In fact, can we just as Christians, can we just ask God to change us so that uh, the first thing that we do when we don't have anything going on is not look at our phone. I mean, it's amazing to me. You look around, people sitting down, and there's people all around them, but we're on our phones doing this. I purposely leave my phone in my car. You say, well, what if someone needs to get a hold of you? Listen, if someone needs a pastor that bad, I can't help them. <laughs> can, I, can I just be honest with you? And neither can you. Okay. Seriously. Unless I'm right there and someone's bleeding out, there's not much I can do. That's the truth. But we need to put them things down. Can we start having conversations with one another again? I mean, my goodness, you sit in restaurants and people are so busy taking pictures of their food and not having conversations with each other. Oh, look, we're out here. Look who I'm with. I'm, doing, I'm eating this food with this person here. Yeah, but you ain't having a conversation. What is that? Really? I, I mean, I rarely, if ever, take pictures of my food. Well, let me just say this. It doesn't look as good as you think it does. All right? Do you understand that advertisers who advertise food, that most of that is frozen or cold, it's not cooked? They just add a little dry ice to make it look like it's hot out of the oven? Because cooked food in pictures don't look that good. It, it doesn't. So I'm trying to help you out. I'm trying to, so put the phone down and look at the person that you're eating with. Okay? It's good. Amen. You can clap. You should shout louder than that, matter of fact. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Sit around, go visit Grandma, and there's Grandma sitting on the couch and all the grandchildren on their phones not even talking to her. 
Listen. Let's read this one more. We're going to have to dismiss. Well, let's see. Where do we want to go? Let me just say this because we're running out of time. Relationship relates, all right? Relationship relates to people. If God has a relationship in you, you're going to relate to people. Religion repels people. Come on. Religion doesn't help people. God wants to love people through your life. 1 John 4, 1 John 4, it says this in verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And in this, the love of God was manifested toward us. That God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. So many times, oh, I just love God. Oh, Jesus, I just love you so much. Oh, I just love you so much. Amen. We, we do, and we should say that, and we should sing that. But understand, we're just responding to his great love. We should be, oh, God, I want to know your love. I want to build on your love. Yeah, I love you, but I want to know more about your love, your incredible kindness to me. You're the one that's worthy of all my praise. You're the one that is lovely forever. You're the one that has reached out to me, and I want to respond. So many times you're like, oh, I love the Lord, or I love, I love the Lord so much. And listen, I, I believe we're sincere, but so many times we forget His majesty. We forget that He alone is worthy of our worship. He is the one who has loved us, who has reached out for us, and allows us to love other people. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No man has seen God at any time, and if we love one another, God abides in us in His love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him, and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and He in God. I'm going to have the worship team come back up. I want to dismiss in just a moment, but I want to sing a song together, very simple, but understanding that God wants to live through us, and if we abide in Him, His love will abide in us, and we'll be able to respond to that love and love Him in a way that we cannot do in our own strength. And then what happens beyond that is He starts to reach out and to love other people. I believe that this morning there's some of us here, you have people in your life, relationships, it's been hard to love them. You've been bitter, or angry, and hurt over things that have happened in the past. And I believe today God wants to show you how much He loves you, how much He loves those people that were involved in whatever that circumstance was, and just change your heart towards other people because everybody needs to experience the love of God. And we're all He's got, people. I'm sad to say that so many Christians were just on our little soapbox, if you will, thinking that we've gained some righteousness because we're good at this and good at that, and we do this and we don't do that, and we walk the straight and narrow. Oh, my goodness. When Jesus said that the way was narrow, he was talking about him. You realize that, don't you? Oh, I'm not saying that we should live a spiritually sloppy life, and we've talked about that, but understand, Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. If you want to walk the narrow road, fall in love with Him through the love that He's already reached out to you. Ask Him to do a work on the inside of you. And so as we sing this morning, let's make that our prayer. Maybe you're here this morning, you've never received Christ as your Savior. I would encourage you to do that today. Say, I need to know God. I've thought that God is judging me, that God is leaning over the banister in heaven just waiting, waiting to throw a lightning bolt at me. That's not God. That's judgmental man. That's not God. God's not like that. I want to know the God who created man, not the God that was created by men. And that's what religion gets you. It's a God that's created by our own understanding. And that's what Romans 1 is all about, that God reveals himself to us, but then man twists it around and makes it more like something he can understand. You can't understand this with your natural mind. It's something that you need a revelation of God's love in your spirit today. So let's worship. We'll dismiss in just a moment, but let's take some time to see God a little bit together and ask him to reveal his love to us in a powerful way. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. 
We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.